getting a lot of um, patients coming through with, with cycle problems. I knew nothing about his bike fitting process. They also said that they had done and so and studied it. And I used uh, there's a few different systems. I was retool and there's a few things. I used bike fit, which is one that was advertised for physios. Um, so on doing the course, I <coughs> found that there was a few sort of holes, either in the application of the service or in the application of the knowledge that these guys have. And when I was on the course. It was aimed at physios, and I was the only physio on the course. Everyone else was a bike tech, and so I ended up teaching them more than they actually taught me. Um, but yeah, it's quite a quite an interesting process, bike fitting. Um, and it's grown in popularity in the last couple of years, especially. Um, you all have one done. Um, do you cleat in on your bikes? Yeah, you do. Um, well, bike fitting is more appropriate to people who cleat in. Um, not that you can't mess around with your bike, it's just the, the type of discipline I use, it spends a lot of time looking at cleats, cleat position and how you lay down power. It's the only interface that lays down power, so it needs to, foot needs to be in the right position, but you can get other, all sorts of other little ailments and problems that can become a bit of a bigger issue on, let's say, a, a Sunday ride. Um, um, I may, I don't know, if some other people come down, I may have to sort of re repeat myself slightly, but hopefully not too much. Um, so, why would you have it done? The primary goal is to optimise power. Uh, avoiding injury is what a lot of people will say, but from uh, where you find most bike fitting, where you find the service, is usually in a bike shop. And so what they'll look at is performance. They'll try and sell it as a, this will make you better on the bike. From my perspective, I would say it's an injury prevention thing, but it's also potentially something that could cause injury, um, which is where I kind of hit a bit of conflict with the process. Um, so if we just look at the average, you know, if you do a 100 mile race or 100 mile ride, you're going to have a minimum 40,000 revolutions. So if you've got a small ailment that's not quite right and you go and do 40,000 presses on it, it might start to load that tissue a little too much and cause you a few problems. And so having the bike set up correctly can offload that. Um, the knee is the most common place that, um, that I see uh, so most of my patients come through. However, foot pain is a big deal. Also hand and wrist pain, um, and they're not on here. But I've got, at the minute, I've got two hands, two guys with hands. Um, I've got a couple of guys with feet, foot pain, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that later. Um, but neck and upper traps, basically if you're overreaching to your handlebars or down onto the hood, you're going to extend your head a lot and that even doesn't, just doesn't feel nice when you do that for long enough. If you just do it now, it's not going to feel great. So if you're out all day, that's going to tighten your neck up wonderfully. Who here has a desk job? Excellent. Um, and so, yeah, you're basically feeding into that. So when you get to work, I doubt any of you sit like a Victorian landlord, do you? No. So you're going to end up anchoring through that again. And that's why it's very common for the base of the neck, especially going into the shoulder blade. If any of you get any pains like that, I know we've got a rib problem at the minute, uh, but essentially um, those kind of problems are generally due to a stiffness of the lower cervical bones, cervical being the neck. Um, so bike sizing is what you should have done when you buy your bike. They should measure the frame that is individual to you, suits you for the right height. You can imagine if you get a frame that's too short for you, a bike fitting, which requires maybe replacing a part, this, that, the other, you know, a different uh, saddle stem, a uh, different set of handlebars, it becomes more obscure and abstract the, the, with a poor bike fitting. Uh, and then you get what a lot of places do, and our Evans do this one, and uh, I think a lot of places advertise it actually as a sellable thing called the Stack and Reach, but it's just where they, where they look at you in a slightly bit more detail. So looking at saddle height, looking at distance from butt to hands, that kind of thing. Uh, but actual bike fitting is altering the bike, so it's making necessary adjustments, and not only to the bike, but to your cleats on your shoes. Um, do you, what, what, what cleats do you use? Is it Shimano's? Or the, anyone on speed plays? Kilo. Kilo's. Yeah, um, the, the Shimano's tend to be the easiest to adjust. Uh, just so you all know, if you got home today, and you can, if you've got, if they're clean, and you can get at them, 
Um, if you, just as a general rule, pretty much everyone I've done a bike fit on, um, I've had to take their cleats, so you turn the shoe upside down, and obviously you've got the inside portion of the shoe and the outside portion of the shoe, and that will definitely fit each shoe. So make sure you're going in the right direction. Uh, put the shoe facing you, unscrew all the things, pull the cleat right down, and stick it out to the side. And that is generally where I would start most people off with fit anyway, because for some reason when you come out of the factory they would be quite forward set. So you, you end up having, if this is your foot, or rather, well, let's just have a look at my foot, your power should be coming through here, this kind of area here. That's where the spindle needs to be. And with a lot of people, it's either here or up here. And so when you're out of the saddle laying down power going uphill, for example, no, you don't, you've just not got that correct interface. So the number one thing I hear from a lot of people is that feels better that feels more efficient and that comes back to the kind of the, um, the power work on it with bike fitting. However you can get some uh, foot based problems with cycling that you wouldn't, you can get with running and you do get, I do see uh, with people who wear too tight off your shoes and things, but things like Morton's and Roma you may have heard of, I don't know whether you have, um, and also what's called Halix of Alvis, if anyone you know has got a bunion that they've had removed, that would be, yeah. Um, so what can happen is your toe will go out to the side and you get a bit of grip, you have that removed, that's fine, but you get a bit of increased distance here. And that can often be mistaken for a Morton's neuroma. So you get a lot of people treat you as a, as a totally different problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there might be a complexity in your foot you might need to sort of have a look at, mm -hmm. but essentially just making sure that the cleat is in the right position will lower the power, displace the power perfectly through the metatarsal heads as opposed to other one, which will make life feel hopefully be a bit more comfortable for you. Um, so the foot pedal interface is the main, and it's the, it's the most important one really, um, because adjusting that will cause adjustments to everything else anyway, um, and then all the others should be addressed accordingly. Um, and the foot pedal interface is, should be, oh, it's a, a lot of the journals, and a lot of the, uh, the text that you find will say that it should be over oh, the first metatarsal head should lie over the pedal axis, which basically just means that the lumpy bit of the base of your big toe should be on the spindle. However, that's not that accurate. It should be between your foot, much like your hand. My knuckles here, if you look at them, they're not in a straight line. They're kind of angled down. And so what you want is the spindle to be covering all of them, so in running from that area that's in between. Um, but that could differ from person to person. Um, leg length discrepancies are a bit of a killer in cycling and can lead to all sorts of, stuff, all sorts of problems, especially pelvic pain. Um, now when you're walking around the clinical significance of um, leg length discrepancy, although most people, especially those who've been to see osteopaths, chiropractors, they'll be told they have a leg length discrepancy, it's because we all do. Um, the, the severity of it when you're walking that is a one and a half to two inches um, is the clinical significance in, in terms of walking around. When you're cycling though, just a fraction, like six millimeters can give you uh, enough of a problem. Um, and that's just because of the, me the mechanics of what you're doing. Um, so what do we do with the bike fitting and the foot pedal interface? <coughs> Before and aft, so basically moving the, foot, the, the, the cleat forward or backwards. Um, we can move it medially or laterally. This is a big deal in terms of knee position. Um, I saw a couple of guys doing it this morning uh, where they ride, they were firing down to Richmond Park um, to do the mountain stage it looked like and uh, they had their knees going in towards the frame and tucked in, awful position, awful. And this is the problem with swimming, running and cycling. There's a lot of dogma around it and there's no research. Uh, so everyone's told to do that because their mate does it or because their, their triathlon coach tells them to tuck knees in because of aerodynamics usually what gets quoted. However, if you're doing over 85, 90 miles an hour, I'll go with you on that, but I've never seen anyone doing that on a bike, especially down the approaching road. Um, it's more about efficiency and the stresses you're placing on your tissues, especially at your knee. Your knee doesn't just go in towards the frame, it rotates in, and the arrangement of all the ligaments around your knee are based upon a normal for you. You are now removing that from normal and you're putting 40,000 stresses if you do 100 miles an hour through that abnormal knee, and so it can give you quite a lot of problems. So the medial lateral cleat position, if your knee, if you're on a bike and I, and I set my lasers up and I have a look and I find that your knee's drifting in towards the frame, I'm gonna move the cleat on your shoe out. And that basically moves your foot closer towards the frame and brings your knee out. 
and that puts you in a better biomechanical alignment. It's all, it, yeah, it, when I sat there and they told me, and I was like, you know, it, it just works that way. Uh, and um, the horizontal angle of the clean, anybody have orthotics in their shoes? Yeah. Same sort of thing here. Um, the measurement of that is pretty poor. Um, I'm not a big fan of it. Um, just as the same as I'm not a massive fan of the measurement for orthotics. There'll be a talk on that later, I don't know if any of you come into that. Um, here we do fairly complex measurement, but in other places they tend to do what's called the static foot posture index, which they look at you stood and determine whether you've got pronation, flat arch, whatever. Gives you no information about how that foot moves when they're walking. You know, so cycling as well, the the amount of pron pronation, what's called forefoot varus, is just the clinical term for it, is done in a non-weight bearing position, and then you go and put weight on it. So the applicability of that measurement. If someone in here, if you've got the scientific mind, you can come up with a uh, forefoot varus measure, measuring tool in weight bearing, you'll be a millionaire. Just remember that. Um, rotational clique position. Rotation happens all the time in the legs, in the upper body, all the time when you're moving in seemingly a linear way, running, walking. Your pelvis goes through a multitude of rotational movements just when you're walking, and when you're cycling, it's no different. Um, a lot of people can be pigeon toed out. And so having your feet facing forward can be uncomfortable. And so I think the yes, the speed play cleats, they're the ones that have a rotational drift in them. I'm not sure about any of the other ones. I don't know about yours. Do they allow it depends them? on the colour, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it, it tends to be like the more expensive the cleat, really. Yeah. The more money you'll check out. The speed yeah. play ones, they're really good in terms of very technical, but they're quite brittle. So for everyday use, the Shimano one would be just better because it'll just take the pounding of a commute. Whereas if a speed play one, I'm not in a uh, physiotherapy kind of way, hence this talk today. If, like a lot of people, your tibia isn't straight, it's the predicate on the assumption that one leg is equal to the other. Seldom ever that is that ever the case. And also that your tibia grows straight down. Often it can grow and rotate out. So having you then biomechanically aligned up straight is actually bad for you because your bone shape is not quite right. Does that make sense? And so this is where, when you go and if you ever have a bike fit done, this kind of thing needs to be looked at because it doesn't tend to get looked at. Um, cleat height adjustments, again, going for leg length. But a lot of this um, is, is, is predicated on an appreciation of biomechanics and specifically foot biomechanics, of which there are sort of 34 bones in the foot. So all of them have independent movement. Pretty complex piece of kit. Um, and Whereas I don't know really the ins and outs of different thickness and different grade of carbon fiber framing. Um, I wouldn't expect uh, a bike technician to know about the foot, really. Um, okay, other contact points on the bike. Saddle position, that's a good one. Um, anyone out here get groin problems? Numbness, pain, ever had that? Uh, the pudendal nerve is one that comes from your, uh, from your pelvis and feeds into the groin area. Um, you're in the minority, but it's a big, it's a big one with the women. Uh, quite specific, focused growing pain. If you know what I'm getting at, um, my girlfriend had it massively, and so we had to uh, adjust the bike accordingly. We had to get a whole new saddle to take it through a range of saddles, even though we we just did the height of everything, did the whole fit, did everything. It still wasn't quite right. Um, so saddle position is a big one, and often people don't sit on their saddle properly. People sit too far forwards. Um, because you're eager to get where you're going. Um, but by not sitting on the saddle, you are actually hiding problems. So when you, if I have a look at someone doing a bike fit, or if I have someone who comes in for a bike fit, I'll generally look at the obvious things first. You know, if the saddle's like up here and the frames this, that, you know, that needs adjusting maybe. Uh, shoulder, uh, so knee flexion angle, you want to be about 30 degrees off flexion at your power stroke. So that depends where that's taken from. So uh, if I'm cycling down at the bottom of my stroke, and it's not actually my power stroke, it's what a lot of, um, I think the retool guys do that, I think they do, they go from here, so they'll, they'll, they'll take your hand around, your leg around, and at the bottom of the pedal stroke, they'll measure your knee angle. We're actually about 15 degrees up is where you actually lay your power down, the majority of it, so it should be measured there, and you're about a 30 degree knee bend. The shoulder angle, this is another one, because this one really depends on age and other co co uh, comorbidities, we we'll call it. Um, shoulder angle 90 degrees from your thoracic cavity, so about here. Uh, but if you've got 
ketosis, if you've got a spinal problem like me, then you can have some that, that varies in its presentation. 90 degrees changes depending on your shape and your mobility throughout your body. Um, that one's a big player with things like lochitis. You won't suffer. Um, this is just as we all get older and stiffer as we get. As we get. You know, I'm 34 and I feel no, I'm a completely different to when I was 24. Uh, you made a rubber and magic when you're that age. But, um, okay, so wrist position. Oh yeah, wrist position is a good one as well. Purely because um, uh, cyclist palsy. Okay with that. Um, due to the excessive pressure on the hoods and the position of the hoods and the rotation of the handlebars, the width of the handlebars, whether or not you, you, you spend a lot of time in the drops, whether you hang off your hoods, uh, you can get compression of the ulnar nerve. Um, and that's a popular one. It's not the ulnar nerve, there's a few nerves in the hand and you, they're all potentially uh, squashable. Uh, but the ulnar nerve runs through here and if you're in that position a lot, you've got quite a nice stretch on there if you're existing there for quite a while. Um, I also ride motorbikes and I find that my hands get really sore if I'm, if I'm on like more of a sports bike and you've got more weight on your hands. So if you're on your side of your bike and you've got too much saddle tilt, and you're, you'll be resting on your hands. Um, and that no bike fit in the world will get rid of that if you, you have to wake your core up and stop being so lazy at the side. Um, Alright, so it's just a global view really. Um, would be the first thing I would do, just walk around, usually with an iPad taking a film of it, and so you could yeah, email all this to you, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and then we would look, um, the other pedal is a big one, um, the, foot, the foot pedal interface we spoke about, and saddle height, this tends to me mess with everything. So if you, um, a lady I was spoke to, to before, she had recently had a bike done by the guys over at Crystal Palace, and they used the retool system and she is not happy, she's happy with every portion of the bike that she feels fantastic on the saddle height, feels too low and their answer was, well we think it's in the right position so it should stay there and it's hard because she going messes with that saddle height, she ruins all the other things that they've done she's, you know, so it's, it's, it's a trade-off trying to get things right and this is where I kind of fall out a little bit bike fitting a little bit because a lot of the time it's done with what you should be in accordance to what the laser says, oh you're not in line so you're not right, this is right now because you're in straight. And if you're not straight yourself, as in if, you're, if you have a wonky body and we all do, fitting that to a, a very straight piece of metal is going to have to take its toll on you a little bit. So there's a, there's a little bit of a trade off between what feels good to you and what is actually objectively correct. Um, This is better. So, um, basically, just a little adjustments and what I what I find helps. Um, so, with neck, raising the stem height, shortening the length of the frame, so you're not reaching so far. If you re if you're more in a, generally a more upright position, you'll be able to tuck your chin in and keep an eye on the traffic in front of you. Um, if you can't, then you know, look at the floor and hit something. Either that, or you lift your head up and compress everything, so you get that kind of neck pain I was talking about before. Um, Cyclist palsy, the ulnar nerve again, um, padding on your bars, raising the stem, and you can reduce the extension of the wrist by adjusting the position of your hoods, either rotating them around or pulling them down. Um, low back pain is probably one that everyone has anyway, you know, so do what you can with that. And we're going to talk about that a bit more in a, in a little while. Achilles tendinopathy, I actually find, a correct is appropriate, I actually find that Achilles tendinopathy is actually managed by cycling. Really weirdly, I quite like cycling because they're not. In fact, my runners who have it, I tell them to get on the bike, especially if they cleat in. I tell them to get on the bike and cycle until they're half content. As long as you can keep your foot in a neutral position, if you're not doing that, you're, you're lengthening and shortening the tendon, and that's what gives you that problem in the first place. If you can keep the tendon in a fixed position while you're cycling, you're loading it, but you're not changing the length, and that is first step rehab for any Achilles tendon um, So I, I, I quite like I quite like cycling for that, and I'm a I think I was in the minority, um, but then when you look at the actual research for uh, management of tendinopathy, it, it fits quite nicely. Um, tib and tendinopathy, um, tib tibialis anterior is just a muscle in the front of your shin, here, comes down, passes over, and acts like a stirrup on the arch of your foot. 
Okay, um, if you get tendinopathy in that, it's usually because you're overreaching. So you'll be flexing your foot a lot to overreach. Um, that's not really a big player in cycling, but it, it's more of a common one in people who, who are new to running, for example, or new to road running specifically. Um, weirdly, to the to, to arts anterior tendinopathy goes away with cross country running. Quite mm -hmm. you know, um, I think it's just because every step's different, perhaps, maybe. Um, Morton's neuroma is what I mentioned before, but it could easily be something to do with uh, what's called hallux valgus or uh, wing formation as well. Um, loosen shoes, not just loosen shoes, get ones that fit. You know, I, I see it all the time, uh, um, the clip of people come in with the cycling shoes and they're horrifically tight and they've been told that they feel they're the right ones for you, they're just not. Um, go somewhere that fits them properly when you're buying them. Um, off the shelf at Evans probably won't just won't do that, they'll, they'll be helping on sale somewhere, maybe I don't know, like fellow sport down the way, I don't know whether they sell shoes there, um, they seem to be a bit more um, forward thinking in their application things like that, so you're going to spend a lot of time in these shoes, essentially, if you're into, if you're having a bike fit, you're going to spend, a, you're interested in cycling, so you're going to be on, you're going to be on the bike a lot, uh, whether it be for work or whatever, so get the right kit, is what I'd say. Um, and also bolt aggravation. Check the if you've had the cleats for a while. Check the integrity of the sole, um, just by rubbing your fingers through the inside. If it's coming through at all or it's bumpy, that's going to be a problem. Um, I think it's just, just common sense really. Um, okay, so knee pain specifics. Um, if you leave your email, did you leave emails at the desk? Anything like that? Do you leave them at the desk? And if you just say, look, and tell them to write. It, Come to physically write them on a piece of paper, give it to me. I can email this to you so you can just have a look. Um, so, the anterior knee pain is just pain at the front of the knee, so that it's the black hole of orthopedic medicine. No one really knows what's going on there, generally speaking. A lot of surgery can be done incorrectly um, at, um, with no avail. Your seat being too low, um, when I'm talking through these, please bear in mind that. You know, I've studied this for a long time and I, I do it every day, and so it makes really easy sense to me. If I'm going, if I'm flying along, just see your hand up and I'll repeat something. Um, so the seat being too low, the seat being too far forward, also the cranks being too long will shift your body weight forward, and so you tend to overload the front of your leg, essentially. Just as um, if I'm doing a squat and I do it like that, with my knees going really far forward, I feel the quads working quite a lot. And I'm going to push up. Most people will squat that way. Um, if you squat with your bum back, you take your centre of gravity like that slightly, you will work your glutes and your hamstrings. Seldom have they ever worked properly, especially in cyclists. Um, so, medial knee pain, excuse me, eyelash, is usually down to stress on the medial collateral ligament and also the medial meniscus. That's uh, not the biggest shout, but the two major, major, two biggest structures in the, in the medial portion of the knee. The reason that's the most common one, um, or the reason it's one of the most common ones, is because all of your joints, your elbow, your knee, and your ankle, anything that's on an, on an arm, and your wrist as well, the medial portion, the inside portion, is the strongest portion of the joint. So when people are cycling along, if they don't have the butt strength, what will happen is their knees will go in because they'll lean on the strongest bit that they have. And that's where you start getting kind of overuse problems. Um, it's the same with runners. Um, uh, posterior knee pain is a bit of a bit of a weird one, but with the saddle being too high or too far back, it can cause a bit of a neural tension. And uh, you spend your time in a flex position. And one of the major things, the, if someone comes to me, like the lady I saw this morning, that she come, that she came in and said, um, I've got a bit of posterior leg pain. One of the first things I'll do is a slump, especially the lower reaches of the neck, is where the problem is. Um, all of these studies, I and mean, 45% of the riders suffer from pain uh, longer than 30 minutes, longer than 30 minutes. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not going to say all of that kind of research. Um, but essentially, understanding why. What I find is um, when people come to me with neck pain, especially in the last four or five months, they've all seemed to have the same problem. Um, insofar as the mechanics of the neck are this. When your head goes forward, the joints of the neck glide backwards. When your head goes backwards, the joints of the neck glide forwards. And if you're in a, in a flex position, you're going to lift your head backwards, and these joints get anchored down here. 
Um, and what happens there is the nerve roots come out at those joint levels. Now, they get tethered forwards and it can cause a little bit of traction on the nerve and it can really set up kind of diffuse, achy kind of pain. It's akin to me hoovering in here and having the wire plugged in around the corner. At some point, that door frame or the door will become a bit of a problem for the cable. This doesn't let it travel, translate as well. Um, so working on your neck and getting stability, not stability, but reducing the stiffness in your neck, uh, which might not present most of the time, it might just present when you're cycling, uh, will really help. But then not doing what you're doing. <laughs> so not going into these old flex positions and maybe having a look at things like saddle height, saddle position in terms of is it too far forward, too far backwards. Are you overreaching? Why? That kind of stuff is, is, is quite an interesting one. Also looking at other portions of your back, so the middle portion of your back, this is where we all curve through, it's very flexed, very sore, uh, very tight, very quickly. Um, simple use of a foam roller, one of those things, just lying across that and going the other way while you're watching TV for a minute or two uh, a day can really, really help with that. Uh, neck rehab, it's pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, these, the DNF, that's deep neck flexor, these are the muscles at the front of your neck which no one ever uses, they become very weak because um, everyone's in this position here, they get very tight around the side and the back but on the front they become quite lengthened and weakened and so these muscles at the front are individual as far as they sit on the vertebrae actually connect to it whereas the ones on the back don't so when you've got no segmental control over your neck so you might have great movement and then one day you'll just think, why have, I got, you know, why have I woken up in neck pain? Or why have I got this? Why do I keep waking up in neck pain? It's probably because of that. Um, probably being the biggest one there. Um, okay. Helmet is a big one. Uh, the weight of it. Especially sort of commuters. I mean, people that, um, you know, if you're going out and you're doing actual miles for, for fun and for competition, the likelihood of your helmet can be really, really but having it in, a, in the wrong position, you'll be amazed at what that can do to you. Um, just in the same way that wearing a scarf can give people neck pain. The scarf is not heavy, but it makes you behave differently. It makes you have a scarf-like posture. Most people do that, and I do it. I caught myself doing it. I went to the rugby last year, and I was sat in the stand, and I was just like, it's just a scarf. Just sit properly, you know, and it just it coerces you into these kind of movements. So having them. Uh, a poorly positioned helmet on your head is pretty bad. Um, having your bike set up uh, as required, as, as per what's found really, uh, would be a good thing. Uh, but then this is thoracic, so the middle portion of your back, having that manipulated, whether it be a crack or a crunch, which you thought, you know, the kind of thing everyone likes to have done, or whether it would just be consistent manual therapy to go through it, release up the muscle tissue, working <coughs> on the ribs that come out of it as well. Um, and this is your cervical thoracic junction. Uh, which is the bit where your neck meets your back. Contrary to popular belief, uh, all the bones in your back are not in the same shape. They, they differ and they have two junction points where your neck meets the middle back and where the middle back meets your lower back. Um, and generally there are areas of major stiffness, um, especially the one at the top because of the way we, we all sit. Fortunately we have a, this lifestyle where we just, you know, we, we have desk jobs, we sit. I don't get builders coming in with neck pain. They come in with smashed hands and stuff. <laughs> uh, people who are active all day don't get these problems. But then when I say the word active, take that as you wish. I still think, and I, I'm a firm believer in it, that a desk job is an active job. It's just a different type of activity. Um, if we all went and labored next door with a shovel, we'd expect to be sore at the end of the day. We might have to maybe train for it to get a bit fitter. But sitting at your desk for nine hours, that's not easy. And the muscles around the back, around the back of the shoulders, they're working really hard. Your arms weigh quite a lot. Mine weigh probably about the best part of stone inch. And so I'm lifting them. And I'm, this is where my base of support will be. And I'm in this kind of flex posture. There's not a lot of blood delivery going to the areas. So it's, it's a bit of an endurance event alone just doing that. You know? And then what we try and do is overcompensate by having a really active lifestyle outside of work. And unfortunately, you don't have the strength set for that. So a lot of the physiotherapy I do is trying to prepare people for the activity that they're doing, including sitting at the desk. Sorry, Jim. Yeah. The stretches that you mentioned. Mm. Upper trap stretching. Uh, the left scap stretching. Arrow, windmill, AA. Oh, God. These are just they're all names. 
for different things. I, the reason I put these in is because this is what, if people have been to physio, they may have been told okay. um, that they, they, I don't tend to subscribe to a name. If I find a tightness in a specific direction, go for that stretch. So if we, a, a great trap stretch is just basically looking forwards and going to the side, keeping your shoulder anchored. But you might have to go a bit more forwards, a bit more backwards, because anatomically you're different to me. So this, if you YouTube these, I'll show you a very specific stretch, but uh, I don't really like doing that. Um, all right. So, do I bike fit or am I just a physio? I don't really, I don't really see why people come to me for a bike fit. Um, if I have the wrong torque wrench and I crack your frame on your bike, not great. Um, and I'm not willing to really take that risk. The guys around here that have, you know, the the, the, the fitters around here, they live and breathe it. You know, they, they really do. But where I think we come together <coughs> is that I know the body and I, I work with people every day. So yes, I have knowledge of bike fitting and I'm able to do one, but I don't really see myself working in that. And uh, you know, you guys correct me if you, if, you, if you think I'm wrong, but if you've had a bike fit done and you spent a lot of money on it and you're still getting pain, hmm, what's that about? So essentially having someone who would know the process and be able to look at you I think is a bit more of an interesting thing. So I'm trying to maybe carve a niche out and working, trying to work with the guys down the road, the disciples and fellas, but to try and see if they have any clients like that that are problematic. Um, tools available is a big one because the bikes are so complex now. Um, just to have something that can measure the right saddle position would be 900 pounds just for that piece of kit. Um, and it's all about business model, I suppose. Uh, and the placement of physio, more often than not, you know having the correct bike fit, and I've got a few guys at the minute who, oh, I've, had, I've had a bike fit done by the best guy in the country who works with, he used to work with the Sky team and all this sort of stuff, and you just think, oh, yeah, but you still got pain. So, what do you want from it? You know, like, I would suggest that having a look at yourself, get, if you buy an expensive bike, it is worth getting a bike fit done, but then that is about 60% of the problem, it's another 40%. And I would have a look, a long look at yourself, especially if you're doing a lot of miles, doing a lot of training. If you're, um, if you're planning to change your training in any way, if you're competing for an event like the attack or something like that, um, we just don't have the hills. Right here. You know, so essentially, when you're going to do an event like that, your, your training will prepare you X amount. Um, and so you need to find out where your weaknesses lie why your knees drifting in even despite you know you've got a cleat position change you've got a foot wedge in you've got all this but your knees still dropping in probably because you've got weak glutes and you need to strengthen them up but you'll never find that until you test them appropriately and that's where i think physiotherapy comes in um, i don't think most people coming to me would need a lot i think they just need uh, an assessment and some advice really maybe a review every, every now and again but it's just about training smartly rather than hard um, I don't see where, if you hammer something all the time, if you do the same thing all the time, expect them a different outcome, that is the living, breathing definition of insanity. So essentially, if you want things to change, have a look at what's going on. Um, common ones are medial knee pain, lateral knee pain. Often the lateral knee pain ones are the outside knee pain. Often people who have given up running because they couldn't get rid of it. Uh, I got runner's knee so bad and the physio couldn't help me. And chiropractor did there but nothing else ever changed so the doctor told me to just cycle and now cycle like I still get the knee pain and there's something not working there. So a lot of the assessment for physiotherapy will take place off the off the bike out of the saddle and I don't necessarily agree with that either because you're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time in the saddle so I try and do a bit of both. Um, so essentially if you can't do the following things, if you can't hop 40, 40 hops without stopping on one leg, high hops as well without stopping, you're not strong enough. And if you can't do a side line Jane Fonda leg lift to the side, do 70 or 80 reps without stopping, you're just not strong enough. And it's that, it's that simple. And if I could tell you, if I, I, how many people do you think I see a year? And how many people do you think I've ticked off and said they're strong enough? Not many. What will happen is what most people do is they'll come to physio and they'll slow them down. So they'll kick up a stink and I'll tell them not to cycle or not to run or whatever, and that debate starts. And that is that debate is probably the biggest treatment because they stop doing the debate factor. Then the tissue calms down 
and they do the exercises for X amount of time and then they get back on the saddle and it might be that they, they change their routine to change the training volume or something so it stays away for a little while but then it'll generally come back again and then you know physio hasn't helped or whatever so my biggest thing for all of you would be strength 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 prepare yourself for the activity you want to do it's only it's only your responsibility really um, and no one likes going to the gym but if you think of it as preparing for the activity you like. Um, I, in March, February, I'm going to start getting a lot of marathon runners coming through. Um, everyone's allowed to stop trainers on the run, but some are more equal than others. And um, generally speaking, I'll get them when it's too late. And it's because they've not done the strength work, they don't have the preparation. So what will happen is they end up training themselves out of the So they'll, they'll, they'll run because a training program from Runners World or some rubbish like that generally dictates that they have to run or cycle or continue to get the miles in and then they, all the time their ability to actually compete is just dropping down. Uh, so think of strength training as probably, if you're not into it, if, you're not, if you don't like it, it's a necessary evil. If you do like it, it's your best friend. It keeps you in the saddle, it keeps you going, no matter what state you're in. And that would be really my biggest piece of advice to you. Um, and uh, that is very biased opinion, slanted towards what a physio would say, but I get people better every day on this foot. It's based on evidence. Room three is where the evidence takes place. Um, so yeah, so <coughs> bike fitting, you won't be pain free forever, it's very unlikely, and can you start for more and more and more. Um, how many of you had a postural assessment at work? Yeah. You still get problems, or you're all right. You're completely bad. Um, well, they kind of change things, but then it gets a bit uncomfortable because you start changing so, back to yeah, what's exactly. comfortable. So. What tends to happen is people sit too long, and get pain. Um, cycling is not different; it's just another posture. Running is not different; it's just another posture. Um, you sit, you sit for too long at your computer, and you become deconditioned, and you get a problem. And you start reporting neck pain, or the, uh, a portion of your cohort will start reporting neck pain. Or tennis elbows are classic, and so this. My powers of beast are thinking, oh, okay, we'll probably just give them a bit of a postural assessment and take an insurance box. And they come around, change the monitor to height, maybe give you a mouse pad or something, or a chair with an armrest. All that does is license you to sit for long. So you decondition further, and then you get the problems again. What then? We've already given you a chair, we've already given you this mouse. <laughs> so having a bike fit is no different. Essentially, it can give you the green light just to keep your bad behaviours going. So essentially, thinking about those bad behaviours, and it is hard because you know, when there's people out there that offer you a service that will get rid of your pain, it's nice, isn't it? But essentially, the ownership is on you guys. And I, I think if when you swallow that pill and you can move forward with it, life's a bit easier, I think. Um, any questions? Oh, well, you, when you said about um, having your uh, elbow like that, mm. and top of the day, so and it's like well, when you're so you're cycling, back pains and it was to stop when you're cycling yeah uh, yeah you're supposed to have your elbow about 15 yeah. degrees off okay. straight yeah about, that's what the textbook says but essentially again it's based around what might be better for you you might prefer less of a lean yeah. if you're reaching out you're leaning completely on your on your arms probably because your core's not working very very well again i mean I, I, i'll use the motorbike example because i, I just did it recently yeah. because i'm quite a long ride and my hands were really my wrists were quite sore um, and then I realised I was tightening my core, my wrist pain went away. And it's because I was actually holding my th my body up myself as opposed to leaning on it. Um, and when you're trying to send all of your energy to the cranks, that's your core generally gets forgotten about. Even though it kind of it, it never gets forgotten about. I know everyone does the core work. I know they do, but they don't. <laughs> um, it all just gets it always gets forgotten. Um, so I would think about the biomechanical. Yeah, if you're 15 degrees offset, you're probably about right. <coughs> but having to think about what your stomach's doing, what your lower back's doing, what positions your pelvis in when you're cycling. Are you like that or are you like this? You know, right? you should be in a relatively neutral position using the stomach muscles to aid that and to maintain that. And that's where you really start counting the calories levels go up. And if you're trying, if you're doing cycling to change body shape, your body fat will just drop off you because you're using more of you to do an activity rather than just your legs. Okay. Any Nope. That boring, was it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've never had a bike fit right. before, but I don't really get any problems 
I've okay. just fiddled around with stuff, yeah. seat up and down, what feels better, yeah. and cleats and stuff like that. So, probably a, a basic question, really, but is there any point in getting one done? Um, well, I've, I don't know, really, probably not. Yeah. Same, same with me. Yeah. I, I if you're not getting yeah. well, if you well flip it then and look at it from a different point of view. Are you happy with your power output? Are you happy with your times? Are you happy with how you feel? I don't know if it could be better. <laughs> That's the thing. Well, the only way you could do it is, I suppose, <coughs> take the plunge, have one done, and see. Yeah. Because what uh, a decent bike fit should be about two hours at least, yeah. uh, and you'll do a lot. Of, you'll do a lot of kilometres in that time on the turbo. If it's one of these fancy ones, it'll be set up with the terrain with the Olympic ride. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they'll do. They'll be like, yeah. oh, you are now, you know, you are Chris Paul. But uh, the, uh, when you're doing, the only way you can do it is make the changes, see how it feels. But if you make any changes, and this is for all of you, if you make any changes to your bike, draw on the bike where the thing was yeah. before, and draw on your cleats. I told you to move your cleats down and laterally. Draw them where they were beforehand. If you don't like what I've said, change them back, but you've got to make sure you're going back to the right position. Get an indelible marker and do it. A silver one's usually the best colour. Um, so um, it would be, the, you know, bike fits are not cheap, though. No. You know, so I mean, if you're happy with how you are, keep going, is what I'd say. If you develop pain, yeah. yeah. And remember, today's focus has been on pain. There'll be another one by a metabolic anal analysis uh, or a sports scientist, which is what I used to do. Um, but they'll be talking about power up, but they'll be talking about your ability to climb, your ability to recover, what happens to your lactate thresholds, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's where cleat position, actual biomechanical efficiency will come in. Uh, but if you're happy with how you are, don't change a thing. Or keep fiddling. Keep yeah. doing what you want to do. Um, it's the same with, if you like, uh, you know, I look at anything, you know, I could I could set up quite easily for cycling, I could set up a screening. I could say to people, come see me, I'll screen you and I'll tell you what's weak, what's strong, what you need to train. If that person has no problem, how can I guarantee I'm actually helping them? I can't. So you've got to be honest and hold your hand up about that. I know that with the with uh, the uh, the majority of evidence and you know my clinical experience tells me I probably will help them, but I can't stand there and say Thanks for your money, I'm definitely helping you. And there are a lot of people in a lot of places that will do that, but you've got to look at it, I think just have a logical view. You're a clever blog, right? You know when you need something done. <laughs> Thanks for yeah. the you, you, you just look, you look wise. Um, so I would say just I would go with go with your instincts on it. Um, this is this talk was not necessarily to sell you bike fitting, it's just to sort of try and try and demystify it a little bit, how we've done that. Um, and you can contact me here at the clinic. The admin address you will have got a confirmation from. Just put for attention of Liam, and it will come through to my screen. If you forgive me, I won't know your names, but if you uh, just put you're at the bike talk and you just want to clarify something, just email me whenever you want. I'll always either do the research for you if I don't know, refer you to someone who's better if I don't know, or I'll give you my opinion and my, my clinical expertise on the matter. Um, essentially, yeah? Yeah, uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. um, so I do get knee, knee pain right. off cycling. Um, should I go for the bike fit first? Do the or? simple stuff, I'd say. Um, I don't know about you, I like having 250 quid in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I prefer it in my pocket or in yeah. the bank. Um, so <coughs> you could go and get a bike fit and still have the knee pain. Mm -hmm. So it might be worthwhile either seeing a physio mm -hmm. or this is a lot cheaper than going to have a bike fit done outright. It might be that it leads to having a bike fit, but yeah. essentially you're probably looking at uh, an amalgamation of the two anyway. Yeah. So what's the what's the presentation you need and how long have you had it? And is it is it because of a smash you had on the knee or a skiing accident or is it just an insidious onset? I think it's an onset based on more mileage right. sort of like reason So a change. Yeah. yeah. It's always a change. A training volume is usually the guilty culprit. Yeah. Um, so I'd say I would have a look at not just the strength of your gluteal muscles, I'd have a look at, have a look at the endurance. So going back to that kind of 50, 60, 70 lifts of, which I'll, I'll promise you is gruesome, it's horrible. Uh, your, your glute med muscle is generally the one you want to look at. That stabilizes your pelvis in the saddle mm -hmm. as well as you're laying power down. Um, but your knee, you could all hold you. Yeah, 33. Yeah, I'm, you, you, I'm a year older than you. We're not 19, mate. You right. could have wear and tear in that knee quite easily. Um, you could have fat pad, fat pad problem. You could have developed a tendinopathy in the knee. 
that's because of a weak glute and your your tendency to put yourself forward and mm -hmm. so there's a, a multitude of reasons yeah. as to why you might have pain. Um, my advice would be to seek physio first okay. um, and do that by postcode. Come here, see me, uh, go wherever you want. But we're all here. We're here to help. This is why we're here. Uh, what we're doing this for. So knee pain, I would always look at the body first, and that's just my. I suppose, my opinion. Um, thanks for listening to me rabbit on. And uh, like I said, any problems, any questions, give me a yeah. Uh, I'll always try and help you. All right. Thank you very much.